Okay, it seems uh, the video is done. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So welcome to this um, session. Uh, the session title is How Can We Better Manage Water for Food and Public Health in Changing World? So in this session, we will have six speakers, panelists, so who will share their experience, research results with you. And I am your moderator. I'm Rabindra Wosti. I'm a senior water resources specialist, uh, currently based in Manila, working for Asian Development Bank. And I have my colleague, um, uh, Gray, uh, Gary uh, from Australia. Uh, he will be the co-moderator. So Gary, over to you. Thank you, Rabindra. Look, welcome to all our delegates online and to our panelists today. I'm Gary Jones. I'm, as well as being a moderator with uh, Rabindra today, I'm also a director of IWRA and very pleased to be uh, here, help with you today in supporting the uh, annual online congress of IWRA. I just have some quick housekeeping uh, matters for you before I throw back to Rabindra. First of all, just to remind everybody that sessions are being recorded. So just be particularly for our speakers, be aware, remind you of that they're being recorded. Uh, so they can, the reason we do that, of course, is to make all the presentations available to people who are in difficult time zones who couldn't join us today. So all of the talks will be available uh, on the conference website after the conference is finished. So just to remind you about that. These sessions are, as Ravindra said, designed as panels. We have six speakers who give a short 10 minute presentation. If they spend less than 10 minutes, uh, we can take a quick question. But generally speaking, we have half an hour at the end and we will take a lot of questions. The way you put a question, if you're familiar with Zoom, if you're not, if you just uh, take your mouse cursor to the bottom of the page and you will see a button that says Q and A, at the bottom of the page there. And at any time, you can type in a question there uh, for the speaker. And I will be monitoring the Q&A window. And as I said, either pick up your questions uh, during the talk or more likely at the half hour session at the end. Please do me a favor. Your name will automatically be there, but can you put the speaker's name who the question is for, please? Or it may be a general question, that's fine for the whole panel. But if it's for one of the speakers, please put the speaker's name. Um, so we will do all of that at the end. Uh, we have about 90 minutes, as I said, uh, the talks will be available at the end. The chat box is not working. So please don't try and use it. The normal chat facility in Zoom is not, not widely available. So it's only the Q and A uh, feature of box at the bottom that is working. So um, having said all that and generally given you the housekeeping, I will throw back to Rabindra to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Gary. So without any delay, um, let's invite Dr. Matthew Carteny. He is at the team leader uh, of the research group uh, from International Water Management Institute, um, IMI, which you know very well. Um, he is based in Sri Lanka. So Carteny, Dr. Carteny, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're from. Um, I'm just going to give a very brief presentation on a project that we're doing in Myanmar, which is looking at how we might transform food systems in Myanmar to produce more nutritious food in a more environmentally friendly way. This is a project, a, a joint project with IMI, uh, World Fish, and the International Rice Research Institute. Next slide, please. As you probably know, there's been a lot of discussion uh, recently about how uh, food systems need to change. And the Eat Lancet Commission in 2019 um, came to the conclusion that food and food system, managing food systems is actually the strongest lever we have to optimize not only human health, but also environmental sustainability on Earth. Um, and so that was the, the major conclusion coming from this, this um, very intensive study um, done in 2019. Next slide, please. What is true for uh, global food systems is also true for Myanmar. Um, and the, the 
food system in Myanmar basically it fails to deliver healthy diets for a significant proportion of the population. Um, malnutrition levels uh, remain unacceptably high, um, and 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 agriculture is also a major contributor and driver of environmental degradation in, in, in the country. So although there's abundant agricultural production at the national level, and in fact Myanmar is, a, is an exporter of rice um, and other crops, it doesn't translate into adequate food and nutrition security uh, within the country. And there's a couple of re um, surveys done fairly recently, which showed, showed that significant numbers of households um, are actually food insecure and um, you know, nutrition statistics in the country, high levels of malnutrition, et cetera, bear that out. And as I say, agriculture is also a major driver of environmental degradation. So deforestation, mangrove loss, soil degradation, water and air pollution, um, fisheries in decline, et cetera. And it's also a contributor to climate change, which I'll come on to in a bit more detail in a minute. Next slide, please. So in this study, we looked, we started, we started with diets, looking at diets, and we did some analysis looking at diet gap. Um, and so what, how diets within the country are, are insufficient. The project itself is working not at the national level, but at state level. So looking across the different states within Myanmar. And this graph just shows the, this looks at food consu consumption, um, which was obtained from various surveys. Um, not conducted by us, so we're using secondary data, which is national surveys. Um, there's no dietary guidelines for the country of Myanmar, so we used dietary guidelines from the neighboring country of Bangladesh and just compared what people were eating with what's recommended within those dietary guidelines. And there's some variation between the different states, but in all cases, basically the result is that people over consume starchy food, which is primarily rice, and then under consume other food groups uh, and so have insufficient or, 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 very poor, or, or poor diets. And that's a nationwide result, but, and there's some variation between states, but, but um, basically the same result from all the states. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, we're also looking at water footprints, so thinking about how much water is being required to grow food. Uh, this is just some results from the modelling that we've done for this, we're using crop water to look, to look at water footprints. For some of the crops, we're able to divide the water into the green and the blue requirements. Uh, and others, for, so particularly for the livestock, that wasn't possible. But we looked at livestock, crops, and agriculture, um, looking at the, how much water is required. And you can see we've looked at water footprints both in terms of, terms of how much water is needed to produce a ton of food, but also in terms of how much water is needed for a thousand kilojoules of energy for a person and also uh, 100 grams of protein. So looking at it in the context of the diet as well. Next slide, please. And this is just the result from one, uh, one state, the Everwadi state, where we've converted these, these water um, requirements into actual water consumption or water use uh, within the states um, over time. So the top graph shows Crop water use for crop production for rice and other crops, blue and green water. Uh, the bottom left hand graph shows water use in agriculture, which has increased quite significantly over time, although it's not a huge amount of water. And then the bar chart on, sorry, the, the pie chart on the right um, shows agricultural water use for different, different, for different crops, showing quite clearly that the rice really dominates water uh, use within the state in terms of. Um, production in, within the agricultural sector. Next slide, please. Uh, we've also looked at greenhouse gas emissions. So just um, using the emission coefficients produced by the IPCC and comparing that with how much crops are grown and the livestock, etc. cetera. Um, and this you can see shows the graphs on the left, or the top graph on the left shows that the median the emissions um, by, set, by crops and livestock and agriculture uh, within this Irrawaddy state. And um, you can also see on the, yeah, then, then the livestock is the dominant, in, in, this, in this case, it's the dominant um, emitter of greenhouse gases. And then the bottom graphs, a comparison of the different of the states across the country, showing that, yeah, the major states are Magway, Irrawaddy, Sagang, and Bago are the major contributors of um, greenhouse gas 
emissions throughout the country. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a table to show that emissions from the agricultural sector um, are dominated in Myanmar by the agricultural sector. And in fact, livestock overall are the dominant emitter of greenhouse gases, um, but quite closely followed by, by rice. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, there's variation between states, but current dietary patterns are inadequate with respect to consumption of diverse nutritious food groups. Um, and that's particularly they eat too much rice and not enough of these other essentials. Uh, water footprints of agricultural products vary. So livestock use large amounts, but, but overall rice dominates agricultural water use in most states. At national level, agriculture, uh, livestock and rice are the biggest sources of greenhouse emissions across Myanmar. Um, nutrient sensitive fish, the agri-food systems should be prioritized for nu nutrient rich foods and dietary diversity in agricultural development to combat malnutrition. And it's therefore for a healthier diet, there should be more fruit and vegetables. Um, dairy alternatives such as small fish uh, should be are important for the provision of um, calcium. There should be increased legumes and poultry stone. And although one of the major conclusions from that Eat Lancet uh, Commission study in 2019 was that we should be eating less red meat. Um, in fact, in Myanmar, because of the lack of protein, um, actually increasing animal source food, particularly for vulnerable groups, so women and children, um, in the first 100,000 days of life is actually uh, recommended. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be red meat. It could actually come, and we would probably recommend it that it, it, that should come more from from fish. And so there's a the need for a variety of fish species, and in particularly uh, small fish, which bring about a lot of different um, nutritional benefits, and that includes from agriculture as well. And then. Finally, pre-production for healthier diets could, if carefully designed, we think, use both less water and emit less greenhouse gases. So you can get a win-win by modifying the, the agricultural system to produce healthier food, and at the same time, that would bring about benefits to the environment. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gary. It was very short, but very impressive presentations. We really learned a lot. And you clearly showed the correlation between nutrition and water footprint, and also showed the trade-off among different aspects. And certainly, this is something the government can look at and progress. So, Gary, over to you if we have time for Q&A. Well, thank you to Matthew. Excellent talk. Pretty right, pretty much right on time, Matthew. So thanks very much. And we don't have any questions just yet. I've got one saved up for later. Um, so well done. Uh, but just a reminder, I've been keeping an eye on the number of people coming online. We had uh, quite a few have come online since we started. So just for those people, if you would like to ask a question of the speaker, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you can't see it, move your cursor down towards the bottom of the screen and a little bar should pop up in where, in where it says Q&A, okay? So if you, add, if you add a question, please also put the speaker's name for who you are directing the question to. But thank you, Matthew. Excellent opening. Back to you, Ravindra. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, now let's move to our next speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Maria Paula uh, Mendes. She is a researcher in um, CERIS, Civil Engineering Research and Innovation for Sustainable, um, I think it's a Spanish word, but I, I can see that you are the researcher. Portuguese, Portuguese. <laughs> uh, Portuguese, sorry. <laughs> and, and, and she will be presenting um, digital water management for improving resilience for agriculture, food and health as a response to global risk. Wonderful. Floor is yours, Dr. Maria. Thank you a lot. So it's a pleasure to be here. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is a joint work with Diana Likar. She's from Macedonia. You can see there 
that she's from Institute for Research in Environment, Civil Engineering and Energy of the North Macedonia. So this, next please, next slide please. Okay, thank you. So the background for this presentation was the Erasmus program that we have. We were four countries, North Macedonia, Serbia, Spain, and Portugal, where we offer uh, several courses. One of the courses was smart water. And that was very interesting to understand the, uh, how students wanted to learn more about this uh, issue. And during the course, the projects that they um, present to us in the end were mostly related with uh, uh, smart water in irrigation. So that was interesting to notice. Uh, I'm presenting here uh, uh, this Global Risk Report 2021. This is very new where the state where is the statement is that among the highest likelihood risks of the next 10 years are extreme weather climate action failure and human led environmental damage as well as digital power concentration digital inequality and cyber security fail and you will understand why i'm seeing here please next slide please so when we look at food security and climate change, what you see is that the changing precipitation and temperature regimes can increase pest activity. We have also the rise, rising of sea level and flooding and prolonged and frequent droughts that can uh, decrease the quality and the quantity of the irrigation water. And we have also the problems related with salt leaching process, which can increase the salinity of the soil and groundwater. And all this process, of course, can affect crop yield. Next slide, please. So what is digital twins? From a Internet of Things perspective, it's, it's like having a, a a virtual object that can be related with the physical object. And digital uh, twins can be used for identified plant pests and disease, other crops information, soil data, energy and water consumption. And uh, they can help because of that, of course, in the decision making process, improving management operations, reducing operational costs and so on and of course increasing uh, farm productivity. Next slide, please. So when we look at that acquisition, we can talk about remote sensing. So we have the drones, but we can also have, and these uh, I think are more cheap in our days, uh, less costly, I would say, the uh, radar, the satellites, okay? So in our days they can have high special and time resolution, and some of them have open access of the data. So we can starting to um, study and to research ways uh, by remote sensing, for instance, and that is an example, to assess the areas of the soil that are more prone to salinity. Next slide, please. And of course, we have the sensors which are located in the uh, field. So we can have soil temperature and humidity probes. We can have at uh, different depths of the soil profile. We can have environmental monitoring, and we can have also plant-based sensors that measure the sickness and the electrical capacitance of leaf, which can show a great promise for telling farmers when to activate their irrigation systems. Next slide, please. So what are the challenge when we looked for this and we want to digitalize our farm? So we have the inputs like the seeds, fertilizers, pesticides and water. We have the true puts, growing crops, resources and resources. We can talk about the fields, machinery, personnel, and we have the outputs, which are the harvest crops. And we can 
think about a little more and think that farms are part of a dynamic network and share data with many stakeholders, including customers, input suppliers, farmer cooperatives, advisors, contractors, and certification and inspection organizations. So there's a lot to study and to try to, to have a scheme about all. So next slide, please. Okay, this is for saying, uh, and you can click please the other two, thank you. This is to say that fertilized pesticides and water are uh, the ones that we have to consider when we talk about the surface and groundwater quality. Because, and we know that the presence of undesirable substance in food is a critical indicator of their quality and safety, especially as in respect to chemical pollutants, including heavy metals, polycycloaromatic hydrocarbons, antibiotics, nitrates, nutrients, and pesticides. Farmers can simulate corrective and preventing actions and evaluate its impacts on the digital representation. Next slide, please. So looking at digital farm, we can have a lot of different systems. We can have an irrigation system that we have here, um, uh, a detail. Then we can have a fertilizer system, a seed system, etc. If you look at the irrigation system, what you see is a soil master sensor. Then you have a, like a microcontroller that says when to add with the pumps, okay? And we have to have a server database and some kind of algorithm to analyze the data. And of course, if you have historical and forecast data like satellite data, soil, water, and air analysis, we can have a large scale digital twins of an agricultural landscape consisting of many individual farms, each with several learning components, could be able to establish water flow, fertilizer dispersion and nutrient leaching. Next slide, please. So this is back to the star. Digital farm, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's good to have now these new technologies, but there are some issues related with that. If they can deal with several challenges that we have in our days, uh, it's a fact that they are demanding in terms of expertise and so on. So let's look at it. So the advantage is their prevention and control of water pollution, reliability and efficiency of water supply and food security. Sensors are decreasing cost and it is a very important aspect and they are becoming, we have a lot of um, sensors that can be buy in, easily in the market. And the, the components of the Internet of Things for monitoring, like sensors, protocols, controllers, cloud platforms, are diverse and can be selected according to the farmer needs. This has to be to have to do with the Internet protocols, if you have wireless and so on. On the other hand, efficiency is not the same as water saving, and that is a very relevant aspect because we can have a lot of efficiency, but decrease the, the crops or the, the amounts of crops that we are uh, doing and the plots and that can increase the, the, the amounts of water that we are going to use or maintain the same and that can be not good in some cases. And digital twins in agriculture are usual at lower levels of readiness for technology as they require knowledge of a variety of disciplines such as Internet of Things, cloud computing, machine learning algorithms, and big data analysis. And also we have to consider the experts related with digital inequality and cyber security fail. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mendes, uh, for this excellent uh, presentation. Um, of course, uh, digital agenda, agenda will be dominating the global discussion in the coming years. And you rightly uh, bring this um, uh, in terms of water sector, I mean, in water sector, giving us different perspectives, also covering this agricultural supply chain. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Over to Gary. 
Uh, thank you. And Maria, perfect timing. Another excellent talk. So again, we will save questions for the end, but you took up your 10 minutes. Um, just a reminder to where the numbers are going up all the time, the people online. Um, we've got good numbers now. So just for those who have just joined us, if you want to ask a question, please go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, move the cursor to the bottom of the page and the Q&A button will appear. And we will do all the questions probably at the end of this session. We have half an hour for questions. Back to you, Rabindra. Wonderful, Gary, wonderful. And so far we have so interesting um, uh, discussions and let's hope we will keep this momentum over the entire session. So the next speaker is, um, uh, Apologize for my uh, wrong pronunciation. Crazy stuff, uh, Janik, Dr. Crazy stuff, Janik. He is a pro assistant professor from University of Silesia in uh, Katowice, Faculty of Earth Science, Poland. So he will be talking um, about uh, the suitability mapping as an effective tool for identifying potential locations for managed aquifer recharge, a case study, a case study, Dunjak Katzman, Poland. Wonderful. So Dr. Um, Janik, the floor is yours. Over to you. Um, thank you very much for the, for the introduction. And uh, as everybody says, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or, or good evening. Uh, and welcome on my on my presentation. So um, I want to talk uh, here uh, today about uh, MAR or managed aquifer recharge, and I want to share with you with uh, results of uh, of last months of our work in the Deepwater Central Europe project. Um, so yeah, th this presentation was made by me, but also my my uh, dear colleague Sławek Sitek, uh, Agnieszka Piechota uh, from University of Silesia, but also uh, with help of of Jakub Mukawa from Tarn Waterworks. Uh, they are associate partner in our project. Uh, so yeah, next slide, please. Uh, all right, so a few words about uh, our project and uh, what we do, what is the uh, main aim of, of our work. So the, the main uh, aim of, of our project is building uh, a joint water resource management strategy and also to facilitate the protection of Central European water resources endangered by the, by the climate change. And basically, why is MAR important in my country, Poland, but also in Central Europe, but not only in, in Central Europe, because MAR is a big topic currently, for example, in India or in Australia. Basically, groundwater is the primary source of drinking water in many countries in the world, in, in Central U European region, but in Poland. In Poland, it is main uh, main source of groundwater. And these resources, year, year by year, are strongly affected by the climate change. So uh, we need to find some solution or solutions for storing water for dry periods, for the periods that we will need water the most, from abundance periods like flooding or the, the heavy rain periods. Uh, so the project partners have taken a closer look at uh, six smart techniques with the greatest potential for development or implementing in Central Europe. Then we have developed a toolbox to select the most potentially suitable locations for, for these methods. Next slide, please. Uh, a few words about the, our methodology. Uh, the developed methodology of uh, selecting a suitable MAR location was pre primarily based on the geological, but also hydrogeological parameters uh, the analysis of them uh, of given selected regions. Uh, the creation of suitability maps took place in two levels of detail, general for the bigger regions in given country and specific in more in smaller regions, but with more detail. Uh, the maps was cre were created by uh, Poland, but also by Slovakia, by Hungary and by Croatia. Uh, the six methods I mentioned a bit earlier uh, were aquifer storage and recovery, the infiltration ditches, industry river and lake bank filtration or IBF, 
infiltration ponds, research dam and underground dam. If somebody is more interested uh, deeper in our uh, methodology, uh, feel free to uh, download our uh, toolbox uh, from ResearchGate, but also you can visit our, our project site and watch, for example, a short YouTube video that uh, there is presented what, what MAR is in pretty much simple words. Next slide, please. Uh, here on the left side of the, of the slide, you can see our, um, our study area at the general screening level. That is a River Dunai catchment. Uh, its area is uh, around 5,000 uh, square kilometers, 4.8 to be, to be precise. Uh, as you can see, it is located on the uh, southern so uh, side of, uh, of Poland. Uh, and on the background, this map is made, uh, of course, in uh, ArcMap. Uh, on the background uh, of, the, of the map, you can see the hydrogeological maps of uh, our area, and most of them is, uh, is first aquifer. Uh, what criteria did we use creating the maps, uh, analyze, in, analyzing uh, uh, sheet by sheet of each, of each uh, region? Uh, and the, the, the maps we were using were in the scale 1 to uh, uh, 50,000, by the way. Okay, what criteria did we use? Uh, first of all, distance from surface water source. Uh, then lithology of surface formations. Also for some methods, we were using slope angle, like for infiltration ponds. Uh, depth to the top of the aquifer, but also depth to the groundwater table, as well as lithology of the aquifer. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see an example for, from, uh, from our toolbox, from our criteria, uh, we had uh, some thresholds, some, some ranges. Uh, what is suitable, what area is suitable, what is not suitable. At the general level, the most of the data we were taking uh, were uh, archive data, but also we, we used some uh, borehole logs from Polish geological institutes or some cross sections. At the specific level, which I'm not talking about uh, today, but at the specific level, we were doing, uh, for example, some field works, uh, drillings, uh, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, here you can see some results of, uh, of our work. Um, maybe not some results, the main results, basically, of the general screening. Uh, uh, first, the three methods, ditches, IBF, and uh, ASR. Um, as you can see, for ditches and IBF, uh, we have to, we have chosen uh, after the after the mapping that the three uh, areas are the main uh, suitable areas in our catchment. Uh, these are the industrial areas, uh, basically the neighborhood of three uh, three cities: uh, Tarnów, Nowy Sącz, and uh, Nowy Targ. And the Tarnów area uh, was uh, further chosen for the specific screening, by the way. Um, on the A ASR method, you can see that uh, almost half, uh, half uh, of the area, 50% uh, almost uh, was chosen as a, a suitable area, but this is um, a little bit tricky because uh, the ASR method is connected with, uh, with the drilling the, the wells. Uh, and uh, the big part of this area uh, is located uh, in uh, Flash. And as uh, some of you may know, uh, <laughs> uh, if you're from Europe, um, the, the flysh areas are uh, very often tricky in terms of hydrogeology. The conditions, uh, uh, the hydrogeological conditions are very often uh, complicated. And if uh, probably if we would choose uh, some of these suitable area from the general level to more precise specific screening, maybe it won't be so much suitable. But anyway, I would leave it uh, right here. And next slide, please. Uh, here you can see the three maps of the, of the last three methods, infiltration ponds, underground dams, and recharge dams. And as you can see, the underground dam also seemed pretty much promising, uh, like, uh, IB, uh, like IBF or ditches. Uh, I forgot to mention that these three areas are the Paleo River areas, uh, 
uh, with a shallow groundwater table. Uh, these are the, the alluvial uh, aquifers made uh, mostly from uh, coarse sands or, or uh, gravels. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, okay, to conclude uh, to some conclusions because my time is, uh, is running out. Uh, with the methodology used, it's possible to determine where there is a, uh, there is a potential six types of MAR to be implemented uh, and where more detailed research should be conducted, like I said, specific screening. Three methods seem to be most promising. Uh, like I said, IBF, 12% uh, of the uh, analyzed area, ditches 13% and underground dam 15%. Uh, and we have further identified three potential areas where the implementation of these types of MAR, uh, enabling uh, additional supply of the aquifer, uh, could be the most beneficial. Like I said, Tarnów, Nowy Sąd, and Nowy Tar areas. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, at the end, uh, I would uh, ask a question. How would MAR make a difference? So based on the maps created, the application of any of the proposed uh, solutions in the study area can contribute in future to, for example, maintaining, enhancing, and securing the water balance of groundwater systems, as well as increasing drinking water resources under stress as a consequence of uh, the negative effects of climate change. Uh, and in the research area, MAR can be an efficient barrier to various contaminants and dilutes and dilute them in the groundwater as a result of increased artificial recharge. And we have chosen Tarnów, I forgot to mention, because in the really close neighborhood of our well field uh, is located Grupa Azoty nitrogen plant. So uh, in our area, we can study MAR itself, but also we can study uh, the contaminant transport of uh, some nitrogen uh, compounds. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, that would be it from my side. Uh, again, thank you very much for, for the attention and for giving me a chance to, to present the results of our work. And uh, more information you can find uh, at the presented links, but also the maps I was talking about, you can uh, explore for free on our project map viewer on GGIS system of IGRA. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Janik, uh, Janik for this wonderful presentation. Um, and certainly you, you, you gave us a picture of six different MAR options and also uh, discussed the pros and cons on that. And you also admitted that uh, it's subject to different other factors, uh, including um, locality and other factors, right? Thank you again. And uh, Gary, you. anything before we proceed to the next speaker? Uh, just a quick one. Uh, look, on time again, thank you uh, to Christoph. Again, for those of you who are putting up questions, thank you very much. We are not ignoring them. I'm taking a note of all of the questions that are on the Q&A, and we will do address these one by one to the speakers when we complete the six panellists, and we have half an hour for questions. So please put, keep, keep putting your questions up there. Thank you. Okay, without any delay, let's move to our new, I mean, next speaker, who is Dr. Enrique Fernandez Escalante. So he is from IAH MAR Commission, Targas Group. So he will be presenting the COMAR concept and how the groundwater user associations um, are improving integrated water resources management schemes, governance, and water security. So, Dr. Escalante, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Sosti, Dr. Jones, for this slot and this opportunity. Thanks to Yura to organize us also for the opportunity. Let's go to the bull. Uh, can you pass, please, the, the slide? Okay, introducing the, the topic, managed aquifer recharge is a promising set of, of techniques to improve the integrated water resources management. And in Spain, there is an obligation by law of being organized in water users associations or CUASs to negotiate to deal with the water authorities for those aquifers in risk of over-exploitation or, or intensely exploited. 
So, uh, so in, within this context, the participation of the end users in decision making, it results in really important in nowadays. And in this presentation, we are going to expose so what the resources management advances thanks to groundwater users associations. Next slide, please. Okay, the key issues addressed are how people, public, private partnerships enhances governance and water security, how the intervention of end users in the decision support systems is improving uh, in both hard and soft measures, how the communities of users in the area of, of this presentation have given birth to the term Comar or Comanich Aquifer Richards, and how the spaces of trust or confidence are being resulting to be really key in these achievements. In this press release, uh, it is in Spanish, I'll translate it, the water authorities uh, handled the creation of 39 community for groundwater users. Next slide, please. Okay, the background in the area, uh, we are talking about Castilla y Leon in, in Spain for two water bodies where in which the water exploitation index are over expectations, Los Arenales and Medina del Campo. Here in the chart, we can see how the groundwater level is declining in the last decades. For the first case in the Medina water body, it is coming down and down and more activities are being implemented right now. So probably for the next year, we will be able to see a, a change of the term, a, of the turn, a turning point, sorry, in this chart. And in the second, after 25 meters of groundwater decline, the, the response from the water authorities and especially the Ministry of Agriculture of Spain uh, began for more sites in the area and the water level is coming up again in a pace of 24 centimeters per year. Next slide, please, Monica. Okay, this is the background. And just to mention with this slide that the, these sites do not only rely on MAR for the integrated water resources management. They also are dependent of damming the diversion of sur surface water from rivers, the groundwater exploitation, of course. And also three of the four cases are using a circular economy approach thanks to the reuse of water coming from wastewater treatment plants and even the use, the inclusion in the topological schemes of uh, wetlands, either artificial or natural. Next slide, please. The methodology is uh, for the Comar methodological approach is a literature review, the case study approach, the collection of info, and more than 50 interviews and surveys conducted by the, by the authors of this presentation and their teams. Also five workshops have been organized in, in the area, achieving some findings. The key word for this slide will be dialogue, too much dialogue among water authorities, among stakeholders, and among the third group of stakeholders. I, I'm introducing this concept in the next slide, please. Okay, talking about the results, the end users participation in decision making in both hydrograms. For the, on the one hand, we have the organigram for the water authorities and at the bottom of the tree, there is the hydrological planning and citizen participation commissions. So general population can participate in the decision making process and especially the other commissions where there are include the 39 uh, communities of irrigators um, exposes in the pre release of the previous slide. And regarding the stakeholders organizational scheme, there are two representatives per village in the decision making process. It is a typical board um, scheme. So, for example, for El Carracillo area, there are 14 villages, so 28 people have vote and voice in the decision making process. Also, it is uh, worth to mention the improvements in the hard and soft measures, what entails in the technical issues and in the organizational ones. It is also a key, um, key the space of collaboration. It is a socio-technical system improvement that entails a very friendly uh, area to deal. 
uh, the different agents, the water authorities, stakeholders, and the third term, what we have designated, stakeholders. Stakeholders, according to the previous presentations, are all of us, or most of us. People in the second, in the third row, that intervene uh, in the decision making process, helping, providing information, providing um, capacitation, on, on, on as simple mediators in many cases. So we ask to the community to accept this term because by the moment we are missing and this ter any term to designate all of us, all people from the second or third row participating in the water management improvements. Next slide, please. So the results for and the stages to implement the Comar system are quite equivalent for a normal Mar system, you provide the proposal, including a, a risk and an impact assessment. There is a intense monitoring of the activities and the water authorities are willing to provide a temporary allowance to this permission. After the operational a permanent control, very intense and during some years, they will grant the full operational permit. The main difference with the singular MAR system is that stakeholders are also very involved in the permanent control of the system regarding their future sustainability, of course. There are also some indicators for the COMAR outcomes of benchmarking. For example, the density of workers working from the agri-industry in the whole region of Castilla y León and in the four areas where MAR has been implemented. So we have 3.73 versus 11.29, or another one, and there are only a few examples, the number of companies involved in working in operating in the area, 0.46 versus 1.28. So Mar is being important in, in the region. Next slide, please. So jumping into the conclusions and recommendations, there are too many. I am going to outline only some of them. So Comar at Los Arenales and Medina uh, water bodies are good examples of PPPP, where public authorities and private land owners are key to improve the water resources management mechanisms. The bottom-up approach involving of, uh, end users in decision making is more social and it is resulting to be more effective. Then despite this is a beginning. So then this participation of these agents will be key in the future, but by the moment it is improving and step by step uh, and there are good advances. The Comar uh, concept has permitted higher values of economic and environmental improvements according to the indicators already exposed. These spaces of collaboration are becoming the basis for new governance schemes. I recall it is a friendly environment where people are looking for a win-win situation, not a win-lose. What is not all, always possible, but um, people dealing in water management try to, to make it. And this is an important one. It, a new MAR sites could be improved in both water bodies in Los Arenales and Medina, according to the MAR maps that we have already performed, like in the previous presentation, uh, our colleague has done for Poland. Also to mention that a seat of paradigms is needed for, uh, for the modernization of the irrigation systems, water and energy efficiency improvements, so as to obtain better economic and results and recommendations to deepen the space of collaboration concept. MAR with added post treatment processes is working well and the decision support system combining technical and social aspects. The last slide, please, just five seconds. Uh, we are eager to see online this uh, imminent um, release of the third um, publication of the global water security issues where a chapter uh, talking about Comar has been published uh, thanks to UNESCO for this inclusion and everybody can broaden this information. With this, I finish. Thank you very much, uh, moderators. Thank you very much, everyone, for this slot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Escalante, bringing uh, this practical um, 
aspects of MAR, uh, which was excellent, which was excellent. And you also Thank discussed you about, uh, we usually talk triple P, but you added one P, the people there. Mm -hmm. And I, we can certainly guess how important the end users uh, demand, need, and then, pro I mean, you know, the issues, right? So excellent. Um, uh, I give the, I mean, uh, Gary, if you have anything to add, or we move to next. Thank okay. you. We have to keep the questions coming. We have seven questions already for the next session or the, the Q and A session. So please type your questions in the Q and A box. And again, please put the name of the author you are directing your question to. Thank you. Wonderful. So our next speaker is Mr. Maher Salman. So who is a senior land and water officer? FAO NSL. I guess everyone understands NSL, but FAO is quite okay, right? Um, so he will be presenting how can multiple water use services help mitigate the impact of COVID-19. This looks very timely. So Mr. Salman, uh, floor is yours. Thanks very much, Rabendra. Actually, as FAO is very clear, so NSL means Land and Water Division at the uh, FAO in Rome. Uh, next, please. Um, my presentation actually will follow the ordinary structure describing the motivation of our work on the topic, the approach to obtain results, the results themselves, and the discussion on them. I will also talk about how this particular topic is linked to the scope of the thematic session here, namely water management for food and public health. Next, please. As we all know, the multifaceted aspects of COVID-19 impacts go beyond the effects on health sector. Countries already facing varying dimensions of risk were hit by the trade disruption and also mobility restrictions. This ultimately affected the food security and the poverty. If we just look into one key figure regarding the livelihood, the number of poor people is 20% higher than in the pre-pandemic pre period. So to mitigate this um, adverse impact on food security, we need to increase domestic production. To do so, irrigation remains as key strategy to increase production, thus available food. But on the other hand, we need that, we know that health crisis highlighted the long standing issue of access uh, to clean water in developing countries. We take another figure, 40% globally of the people live without basic hand washing facilities, meaning that the developing of both sectors entails a large increase in water use, so putting pressure on water resources. Next, please. Developing multiple water use in, is, is by itself a promising um, strategy to fight the pandemic while ensuring the basic needs of communities. As agriculture is the largest water using sector in developing countries, efficient use of irrigation water can result considerable water saving, thus enabling the access and allocation of water to other sector and in our pandemic situation, the other sector is health. That's where smart irrigation, smart wash initiative comes or proposed from the side of FAO as a twin track approach to enhance irrigation and at the same time provide wash facilities to vulnerable communities. And we started in Africa, but can extend to other places in the world, thus responding to the needs in times of pandemic crisis. Next, please. The core concept of the initiative actually is based on a stepwise approach, starting with a composite indicator analysis to identify the vulnerability of the countries, more specifically, the vulnerability to food security and health. On the other side, this vulnerability 
uh, with its degree of countries is compared to the spread of the virus to assess potential threat. The second step uh, is that countries are clusters, uh, clustered as per their performance in individual indicators. This clustering guides the direction of investment pathways, uh, whether it should be skewed to irrigation development or health sector development. The third step we take is defining the investment criteria based on the water development and the water resource endowment of the country. And finally, we provide in within the Moose approach a, 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 a list of technologies and we, we provide also more on their feasibilities uh, in terms of engineering, economic, social, and environmental uh, uh, aspects. Next, please. Based on 12 indicators measuring the vulnerability of the countries to food security and health, each country is scored and ranked as per exposure. The risk of the pandemic was measured as per the reported number of cases, fatal outcome, and the suspected exposure of the, of the spread. As the two chart shows, we over lay, we overlap the uh, vulnerability and the pandemic risk. And then we come up with this overlaying map, but we can see that the risk of the spread should be always perceived as dynamic process, i.e. it's not fixed. And the countries should be prepared to, to the possible outbreaks. We can see that in Africa case, there is a weak case because the reported cases at the time of analysis were less than, than reality in terms of, of, of testing. Next, please. So the clustering, as you see, is showing us a, harmon a, harmony, a, a homogeneous country group as per the need for investment in different sectors. The food security, group is the one requiring more investment in agricultural production, thus irrigation. The second group is the redistribution group, whereas irrigation and wash sector should be developed equally. And the third group is the wash group, whereas development of multiple water use is skewed to the wash component. If we look at third group, the third group actually includes all the five countries listed in the global 10 of most conflict prone countries. Next, please. So the analysis is also including an assessment of water resources endowment. In other words, how water availability shapes the engineering configuration and feasibility of multiple water use structure. The most important conceptual difference in engineering design is the water availability. This eventually determines the proposed technologies, but this definition of the investment criteria and the feasibility do require a micro level analysis and a proper assessment of local conditions as the analysis is at macro level uh, uh, mainly here. Next, please. Now to support the compilation of investment packaging as per the country clustering and categorization of available water resources, the analysis provides initial review of existing top technologies in four groups. One, looking at water tower group. Second, looking at water management group. Third, looking at rainfall management group. And last, looking at water scarce, water scarce group. Next, please. So we believe that um, the, our analyt analytical work has a contribution to the topic of water for food and public health as it tackles the impact of COVID-19 through integrated solutions for food security and health sector development. 
the multiple water use, we see it as a strategy to improve agriculture and health conditions in a balanced manner while providing sufficient supply to all demand. The, we, we launched that, that uh, initiative, what we call it smart irrigation, smart wash last year. And the interest in such investment is really increasingly growing. The first project of the initiative was approved by the adaptation fund making available 14 million US dollars to the portfolio of the initiative to FAO to implement, to implement a project in Africa. This also allows us to further investigate and expand the application of multiple water use in countries, whereas the concept is not yet explored. You can visit a discussion paper under the title of Smart Irrigation, Smart Wash in FAO's catalog of publication, if you would like to know more uh, about the approach and the initiative itself. And with this, I thank you very much. And I finish here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Salman. I mean, it was uh, another excellent presentation. Um, you again gave us a practical um, background. Um, certainly, the, the pressure has been added by this pandemic on both food security and public health. Um, you, your, your work, uh, this mapping vulnerability on both uh, food security and public health was excellent. I think our audience also received it that way. And you came up with this smart irrigation and smart was and uh, providing some um, indicators and guidelines for upcoming investments. Wonderful. Thank you again for this. Um, again, back to Gary before moving to the next speaker. Indra, just a well on time. Just a quick uh, note for, we've had quite a few attendees come online uh, in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Just a reminder that you can ask questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, put your cursor there, it will pop up and type your question in. We'll answer those as best we can at the, uh, in the next session starting in question, question time, I should say, starting in 10 minutes. Thank you. Great, thank you, Gary. And our last speaker in this session is um, Mr. Hella Schwarzer-Muller. So he is the head, C is the head, sorry for that. C is the head of groundwater department. Um, I think it's something, uh, a water, water related uh, department based in Berlin. Um, so C will be presenting today uh, the, uh, let me just uh, recap, I mean, yeah, digital water city. Uh, leading water urban management to its digital future, which is also very much related to the previous uh, presentations. Without any delay, so I give the floor to uh, Ms. Schwarz Müller. Over to you. Thank you, and good morning um, from Berlin. So I'm glad to be here today, and thank you for the invitation to uh, IWAR. And I would like to present today our Horizon 2020 project, Digital Water City, that started in June 2019 and is now halfway. The project is coordinated at the uh, Berlin Center of Competence for Water, Competence Center for Wasser Berlin. And uh, I am a geologist, project manager at KWB and administrative coordinator of the Digital Water City project, together with my colleague, Nicola Carado, who is the scientific project coordinator. Next, please. So, the Digital Water City project aims to connect the physical world of the water cycle with digital technologies and to boost the water management in cities, in particular in five case study cities, which are Copenhagen, Paris, Milan, Sofia and Berlin. And it followed the Digital Water 2020 call and has three sister projects in that call frame. In Digital Water City or DWC, as I will use in, in, in the next slides, um, Altogether, 15 digital solutions are co-developed and implemented, focusing on public health, return on investment for infrastructure performance, and public involvement. 
Co-development includes policy and governance issues and cross-cutting work packages are dedicated to interoperability, cybersecurity, and to the route to market for the technology providers. Next, please. So the project is conducted with 24 partners from 10 countries and key partners beside research in the middle and the small and medium enterprises on the right, which are basically the technology providers and, and developers of the solutions. But key partners are also water and wastewater utilities of the five case study cities, which you see on the left. And I will um, show you what we do in the different cities in a minute. So I will not go into details here. Um, what, I would, what I would like to mention is, however, that all the digital solutions aim to contribute to real world problems and current and future challenges in uh, urban water management. And together with all partners, we work on all parts of the urban water cycle, except drinking water networks. Next, please. So here you see um, our five urban areas in which the key innovations will be developed and in which we demonstrate their benef benefits and also involve local stakeholders and the public. So I will go through the cities um, with quick write and then I will show you some more details on some selected solutions. So in Paris, the aim is to improve bathing water quality in the River Seine for the Olympic Games 2024. DWC will develop an early warning system to manage bathing authorizations in each of the official bathing places. And of course, the aim is also to have this as a sustainable solution and to deploy this to other bathing sites all over Europe. In Copenhagen, the aim is to reduce environmental impacts and flooding of sewers and wastewater treatment plants. So there are uh, kind of emergency releases to the harbor area of Copenhagen, which should prevent should be prevented in the future. DWC will develop advanced zero flow forecasts and a new decision support system for real-time control of the wastewater treatment plant operations and will um, yeah, release in sewer retention capacities. In Berlin, the objective is to improve infrastructure performance. DWC will propose a new software for proactive maintenance and strategic planning for drinking water wells as well as innovative sensors for the monitoring of combined zero overflows and illicit connections, which I show uh, with one of my last slides. In Sofia, the main objective is to optimize investment and reduce operational costs of zeros. So therefore also low cost combined zero uh, overflow monitoring technologies are applied and an innovative zero cleaning technology combining cleaning with TV recording. And so you could show the cleaning efficiency and the sewer condition in the same step as uh, cleaning the sewers as applied. And in Milan, the goal is to achieve safe water reuse for agricultural irrigation um, with the development of several technologies, among them a new drone to monitoring water stress and the matchmaking platform to support water reuse allocation. Next, please. So these are our solutions at the glance and their connection to the urban and peri-urban water cycle to illustrate how we can better manage water for food and public health. In the remaining slides, I will focus on solutions addressing urban water management, including sewer network control, wastewater treatment plant management, and hygienic quality of treated wastewater in order to make it fit for reuse and avoid health issues related to bathing and surface water bodies. The full overview of the project with our other solutions can be found on the web page digital-water.city. Uh, next. Thank you. Sewer management includes measures to prevent release or overflows of untreated water to surface water bodies. This can occur due to illicit connections when wastewater sewers are unintentionally connected to stormwater sewers or due to combined sewer overflow during heavy rain events when the sewer capacity is too low to retain the water. The first issue is targeted within Digital Water City with methods to identify uh, these illicit connections with easy to handle and reliable methods. These are distributed temperature sensing and multi-parameter probes in the series, including electric connectivity sensors, for example, and their data are analyzed with artificial intelligence approaches. I cannot go into details here because of the time, but I would like to show you on the next slide, please. 
I would like to show you um, our approach to use low cost and easy to handle temperature sensors as a new technology for measuring combined zero overflows based on an extensive network of these uh, real-time temperature sensors. The aim is to improve the understanding of zero hydraulics to make optimal use of the in-zero retention capacities. And this example is uh, from Berlin and Sofia, where combined zero overflows uh, could already be significantly reduced, um, of course, not only by the project, uh, by our project, but also by past projects. The sensors are available in online and offline mode. At every site, a pair of sensors is installed, of which one is in the zero pipe and more or less always submerged, and the other is at the overflow crest, and is thus only in contact with water when an overflow event is occurring. From temperature differences, the occurrence and duration of such uh, combined zero overflow events can then be monitored. The challenges include, of course, the harsh conditions in the sewers, but so far the demonstration yielded very good results and the data on occurrence and duration of overflow events are now used in hydraulic modeling of the sewers and of the connection to the uh, combined sewer overflow outlets. And we also test now an approach where we use only one sensor at the overflow crest to avoid uh, losing the sensors, which are always uh, submerged. Next slide, please. The second example shows how data and hydraulic models of sewer and wastewater treatment plant capacities are combined into a decision support system, optimizing treatment plant management, such that, for example, retention basins are emptied prior to heavy rain events and crests and where operation is coordinated. And this is particularly important here for Copenhagen as there are eight utilities involved in the management of the sewers and wastewater treatment in the area of Copenhagen. So, um, and of course, as said, Copenhagen has the aim to um, yeah, fully prevent in the future the release of untreated water to the harbor area. So the core of this solution is a forecasting tool, um, which bases on a probabilistic machine learning model that predicts flow in the sewer network and inflow to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and this model is trained using real-time data from water level and flow sensors, but also from rain gauges, weather radar observations, and now casts and weather forecasts. In parallel, a web platform is developed to share inflow forecasts and scenario simulations with the neighboring utilities and give a full overview of key data. So um, my last example on the next slides, please. The last example is related to water reuse. It comes from Milan, um, where an Italian sanitation safety plan based on the risk-based appro um, approach of the, of the World Health Organization is being established. Next, please. So the new sensors and digital tools are applied to prevent bacterial contamination, monitor water quality, uh, at the wastewater treatment plant and monitor water stress at neighboring agricultural plots where the water can be used for irrigation purposes. A matchmaking platform intends to bring together demands from the farmers with available irrigation water in certain quality. And beside routine monitoring of the wastewater treatment plant operation, a new uh, near real-time device for E. coli and enterococci analysis um, has been implemented which is a cartridge system and easy to maintain. Water stress is monitored with ground sensors and drones, and data are visualized in a web GIS environment, which is at the same time basis for engaging the stakeholders. Um, and on my last slide, so that is just a very quick example. In addition, um, a serious game is developed to inform the general public about the water food energy nexus and making the, the, the user of this game or the uh, manager of a wastewater treatment plant and guiding them through, through all the issues connected to water reuse. So with this, I end my presentation and thank you for your attention and have to answer to uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Schwarzenmüller. Uh, wonderful. This digital city concept is now taking momentum everywhere else. And uh, especially after this pandemic, uh, the importance is more, you know, uh, realized now. Uh, anyway, you you showed 15 different uh, these technologies, 
and you are not doing this just in one place, but also I was amazed to see uh, everywhere um, in the Western part of the Europe. Wonderful, the work was done um, uh, very well, and we still need to learn from you. Having said that, now we move to Q&A session, uh, and then I give the floor to my colleague, Gary. Gary, over to you. Thank you, Ravindra. Um, so we have a number of questions. Uh, we have only about 15 minutes to answer those. So we'll do our, I'll do our best. Um, I will take the questions in the order they were put up, but I, I will also try and balance questions to different speakers as well. So I, I apologize if we can't get to all of the question, but it's a bit of a balancing act as you will understand. But so um, the first question I've got is to, uh, to Christoph Yannick. And Christoph, the question is, and I'll maybe have to paraphrase it. It says, can you elaborate more on MAR method for mapping aquifer? You can probably see it. Maybe it means, uh, the, uh, this is from Anup Day. Maybe he, he means, um, uh, you know, the, how do you determine aquifer suitability or mapping? You, you might interpret to that question as you think uh, best though. So that's to you, uh, Christoph. Yeah, I guess uh, it's kind of an open question to be honest, and I'm not, I'm not really sure how, um, which part uh, I should uh, elaborate on, honestly. Uh, so maybe, so... maybe just we're looking for some quick answers now and we can maybe follow up with the individual author afterwards, but maybe we just take the quick question, are there, are there simple ways to determine aquifer suitability for MIR, perhaps? Uh, I mean, it's it's not simple. Honestly, I I wasn't a part of the project uh, yet uh, when the criteria were uh, determined. But uh, as my friends told me, actually, uh, it it took a lot of time to to choose proper criteria for a given method. And uh, by this sentence, I I can. Uh, contribute to the to another question about the the area what about uh, beyond one catchment uh, for example the whole country to to mr nishadi uh, yeah so the the criteria were chosen for the method not for the area so uh, at least in theory uh, they they should be uh, unique regardless of the you know of the size of the of the catchment or or the area, so it's it's pretty tough. But uh, when you have uh, a set of of, a, of of the criteria for the, for example, the general level screening, then it gets easier to to go one step further and uh, to to conduct a specific screening. Uh, I don't know if that satisfies uh, somehow. You can always uh, download our uh, toolbox, as I mentioned on my on my presentation, Mr. Anup. And you can always write me an email and then we can uh, discuss more when we have more more time. Thank you, Christoph. That's a good answer for now. Thank you. So the next question is directed at uh, Maria Paula uh, and it's from Jean-Marie Vianney de Sinjimana uh, from Rwanda. And Jean-Marie is asking, if I can just summarize it, you can probably see the question, Paula, but maybe the summary is about um, how can farmers direct, when there are sensors being put in locally on farms, uh, how can they access that data directly without having to go through, uh, or do they have to go through a central agency, a MET department, for example, or can they just get that locally directly without having to work through a central agency? Okay. Uh, it's related to the, with the weather station, I believe. Yeah, what we, we have, you... Um, Located the weather station in your plot, and then you have something like an app, something that you can use in your mobile phone, for instance, and you can look at it and see the data. Sometimes depends on where you are located. If you don't have wireless, there is still a way to store the information and then make it the download and try to see the data, okay? It's not important to have, uh, uh, how you say, to have contact with uh, your institution or something like that, I believe. I don't know to answer better than this to this question. Uh, I don't know. That's good. I think that's right. And I, look, I'm gonna jump ahead to a question from Nabil Mina while you're still online, Maria. Uh, and 
I think this might be relevant to at least one or two other presenters who may wish to jump in. But the fundamental question with this technology and the and uh, and whether it may have talked about the appropriate technology or others did, how can farmers afford it? Is the question. I think it's a really good question. As we talk <laughs> about it's smart it's tech for irrigation, it's hard enough in fully developed countries like mine or yours, let alone in the emerging in other countries of the world. So how can they afford it? Yeah, that is a very good question, I would say. I think that the best answer to that is starting to have some data like uh, remote sensing data. I think that are more affordable. And nowadays you can have uh, satellites passing with uh, a good uh, time resolution and special resolution. So I started from there with NDVI and things like that. Uh, that is the less costly uh, way to do it. And then if you have scale for that, you can organize in the like a farms corporate organization, something like that, and try to install maybe a drone would be easier and more cheap than the probes because probes you have the anisotropy of the plots. So I consider something like to have a, a cooperation a drone that can pass in the fields and try to assess NDVI and things like that. And when you have, again, <laughs> results from that, try the probes, but that will be the, the step that I would say that is more local and you have the effect of anisotropy and the sensors are cheap, but there is technology associated with that, that can be costly. So I would keep it like that. I'm going to throw that question perhaps to at least two of our other speakers, um, Maya from FAO and Enrique from IAH. I mean, from an institutional point of view, this question, how, how, how are the big institutions and organisations, ADB as well, Rabindra, how are they helping uh, farmers with the affordability? We're pushing new technology, appropriate technology into the, in the developing world, but how, how is it affordable? Who pays? Who would like to go first? Anyone? Oh, Enrique, I can see you smiling. Maya, would you, who would like to go? put your hand up if you'd like to answer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Enrique, thank you. It is a good topic. Thank you very much for the question. I think it's important the capacitation because, as we have seen, and the general population is, uh, is able to participate in the decision making process. There are more and more systems. To, to be listened by the water authorities and to have the proper capacitation is really good. And the best ideas are not only coming from doctors. Most of the good ideas are coming from the general people, the normal people in the farms, in the streets, wherever. So it is important to listen, to capacitate in order to fulfill um, all, any achievement and to, and, and to have their voice in decision making. And how IAH is going to, to do that? By capacitating as much as possible, people needing it. Matthew, I can see your hand, you want to jump in? Anyone else, any other speakers who would like to jump in, put your hand up too, please, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's not really my field, but Amy's done quite a lot of research on um, really cheap sensors, uh, particularly for soil moisture monitoring um, that, can, that farmers can use in developing countries and actually does work really well, where they've, they've done studies where they, they've rather given these sensors out, but they are very cheap, and then farmers have utilized them and actually changed their irrigation practices quite significantly because of the information that they get and improved their irrigation efficiency substantially because of the, the knowledge that they gained from that. So I think that for me, the, the approach would be to try and cut the cost of these sensors as much as possible. And organizations such as FAO and others like give them the farm approach and put in being the cost quite low as that case. Yeah, thank, Maya, did you want to say anything from an FAO perspective on that question of affordability of new technology? Well, actually, uh, thanks, Gary, because I would link it with a question from Jean-Marie on okay. what does it mean by smart irrigation here? Okay. And then if I link it, I explained in my slide, which talks about technologies fitting and conditions that we provide also uh, uh, smart irrigation means engaging innovative technologies in irrigation. 
and then we provide in, in, in our work um, technologies, fitting technologies under four groups. I mentioned them like the water tower group where we gave examples on infiltration galleries or floodplain management. The second one on water management group where we talked about or we, we proposing technologies such as the wetland, uh, constructed wetlands as nature-based solution. A third one on rain uh, fall or rain fed management uh, group. Then we're talking here about water harvesting in situ or um, uh, ponds or cisterns. The last one when it comes to water scarce group and then we're giving examples of uh, fog harvesting, desalinization uh, technologies, etc. Now, this is an evolving process. So these technologies are not those what we are we have we have practiced, we have demonstrated, but they are they are evolving with uh, with success, and they can grow always. And then always emphasize that the, their application should be linked with local conditions first, and then should be linked with what I mentioned earlier, also the feasibility from technical, from, from um, let's say economic uh, and from environmental. So if to, to answer the, the other part, so uh, affordability and suitability is done in a way that uh, the technology is introduced, the, te the capacity of users is increased the, the 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 ownership is being taken and proved that it is um, suitably technical technically suitable then uh, economically viable where we have to propose to to communities how access to that uh, how how could be access to finance to 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 make them if they are more sophisticated um, uh, uh, more sophisticated in terms of of cost then uh, uh, supporting them also. Uh, accessing uh, or, or agreeing with the authorities. Here we have the other side of the story, the, the, the authorities. So if if the authorities take this in, in, in their, let's say, policy, then they would also support uh, users to, 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 to make this happening. So it's a two, two ways equation that should be worked in parallel while in the middle, uh, always uh, new technologies evolve. Hey, look, we thank you. Mayor. Well, look, we have about two minutes left and we do have to finish on time. So I'm just going to um, close up with a bit of housekeeping and then hand back to you, Rabindra, to close the session. We haven't answered all the questions. Um, there's some really good questions there. Uh, but to let you know that there are really uh, two or three ways. Firstly, some of the uh, panelists, uh, how I noticed, have been typing answers to back to, back to people and can, can continue to do so. Uh, even after the kind of formal part of this session finishes. But so there's that is an important thing. But if you don't get your question answered or you have a, you think of a question, I'm sure I know we have uh, uh, either online or there'll be emails available to email the uh, the presenters and ask them questions. And we're in the online world. We should encourage each other to engage through an online process, not just now, but afterwards as well. So please take that opportunity. Just a reminder to let you know that the, the uh, all of the speaking uh, the presentations are being recorded and will be available uh, on the uh, website uh, for the conference uh, with, and also with a link from the IWRA main website. But so will also the presentations as well. So if you have you want to follow up and read uh, a bit more, please do that. So after the conference is finished, and also um, uh, please contact the speakers directly as you normally would. And there are also posters you could look at as well. So um, that's all for housekeeping, Rabindra, back to you. And thanks to all the speakers and back to you to close up. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank all the speakers who gave an excellent presentation. There was no single moment to regret. Everyone was very punctual. Everyone was bringing um, the best they can. And it was a very informative session. And then, um, Gary, at the end, you also asked about this. Well, though I'm not in the position to talk uh, from my uh, institute perspective, but, but anyway, the, the, the main discussion uh, was focused on the groundwater management and digital uh, you know, um, uh, things. 
So certainly, yeah, the affordability, the suitability things we discussed there by addressed by many speakers. The most important things, maybe perhaps we can touch upon in our next IWRA conference, um, more importantly uh, on the operation and maintenance aspects. And of course, the enabling environment of these, um, you know, adaptation of these uh, technologies and so on. So having said that, I would like to thank you everyone, those who are in the front audience, uh, speakers, and even behind the curtain, everyone uh, for these excellent sessions. And uh, I close this session um, hereby. Have a great day, um, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye.